take a stand for the gospel? And if yes, can you elaborate? Okay, so yeah, I have to first talk about my calling. Um, I will never forget it. My eldest brother is a pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church. And one day he sat around the table and he said he doesn't want to go to class today because he had to go write things he doesn't want to write and he doesn't believe in it. And then my dad said, no, you have to go because he pays for, <laughs> for his classes. And uh, that already showed me that the liberal theology was starting to become quite dominant in the Dutch Reformed Church. So um, when I got a call for ministry, I couldn't resist it. I would sit in a sermon and the, it would be like a fire burning from within. I couldn't resist it any longer. I was married already. I prayed with my wife about it. And after about a year, we both had peace that God is calling me. Uh, but I thought to go to America, to Trinity or to Wheaton and some of those places to go study. But that was not possible at that stage. And then um, I remember feeling that God is calling me to go to the faculty where my brother went to at Pretoria, a liberal uh, turning theological faculty. And the verse that I got in my quiet time, I thought of sharing that with you today. Uh, a few days before my classes started, um, I was reading Paul from the book of Acts. And this verse really struck me and became like a life a calling verse for me. In Acts chapter 22, verse 14, it says, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be a witness to all people. And that was for me quite crucial for all people. Um, of what you have seen and what you have heard. Now, obviously, I did not compare myself to Paul at all, but this was for me like um, a calling that God is calling me to go be a light in the dark and I will be a witness to all peoples of all denominations. And that's the verse that took me to the theological faculty when I started. Now, the whole issue of standing up uh, for what is right and exposing what was wrong. I can go into much detail. I'm going to give us about four examples on every continent where I studied. The first one, let's go to Pretoria. So what I discovered after a few years was that they were ordained professors who deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus in their talks, uh, in public forums, on the internet. And then we eventually uh, spoke to the church board. They didn't respond to our concerns. We had respectful conversations with professor. And then we noticed that there was a behind the scenes strategy to appoint new liberal professors. And he finally, we put up a petition that we sent to the church newspaper. Students who signed it were threatened with legal action. They won't be ordained in the church. And finally, I was the only one standing in the end uh, and then eventually I was expelled from the faculty. I discuss all of that in a book that I wrote in South Africa about uh, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, and eventually two students came back. One went back to the professor, spoke to them again, realized that they are teaching heresy. And then he put his name back on the declaration that we signed. And then one other student who uh, became ordained in the church later on uh, was a pastor, is now at an evangelical church somewhere in the Cape. Um, he later on said that he felt threatened and he should never have taken off his name. So I was so thankful to God for those who came back to that. So that was for me an ethical issue. These professors promised to uphold the confessions of the church and the Bible, uh, and they were uh, jeopardizing that. They were compromising the gospel. We had so many friends that studied with us who got disillusioned. Some abandoned the studies. Some became agnostics and atheists. And I had this passion and zeal and concern for them. Uh, that we should remain faithful to Christ. So that was the first one. Let's go to a second one. When I went to Durham University, there I studied. I'm going to talk a bit further about N.T. Wright later. There I discovered that, unfortunately, evangelical scholarship is sometimes marginalized or even excluded. I remember doing a module on Paul. There was not even any additional uh, or recommended reading on the pastorals that said that Paul wrote them. It was all left leaning. That's the one thing. And then I felt uh, we have to stand up for solid, good scholarship, but we have to remain faithful to Christ. That was in Durham one. Then in uh, Europe, I had the opportunity to work with um, a professor who was part of the Bultmann tradition. Now, Bultmann is a notorious, famous uh, German scholar who did not believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus. Here's one of his famous books. He was very influential. And this professor was part of a community of scholars who belonged to the Bultmann group. And I sat around the table and discussed with him a PhD proposal. And uh, 
about the resurrection, body resurrection, the empty tomb. And then he said that, but Paul did not believe in the empty tomb. Uh, and then I said, but what about these texts? You know, and I had all the best arguments that I've done in my master's degree and all of that. And he just got red in his face and refused and just stubbornly went on his own way. And he wanted to probably intimidate me. And I just went out and then decided I cannot work with this professor because I'm going to compromise the faith. That's another example. A last example, I lectured for a while. And I remember I did a module where all the work was left wing. There was nothing balanced or, or even evangelical. And when I included evangelical material on Stott and Tom Wright and others, I was frowned upon for doing that. Uh, and then I just decided, but I have to be faithful. Uh, to Christ, whatever the price. So they have given you about four examples of where I felt that God called me to really stand for the gospel, whatever the price. So next question, how did you get through those times? First of all, I have to say that the Lord gave me the most amazing wife. I, I am so grateful to God for a wife that stood with me through all of these things that we've gone through. That's the first thing I have to say. The second thing I have to say, God sent me friends that I could um, share my stories with and encourage me, mentors. The third thing I want to say, and that might be of encouragement to you as well, if you go through a time of persecution, John Piper's done biographies over many years, every year they had a pastor's conference. And I remember a couple of those talks that I just started to listen. One on John Bunyan, one on Judson, one on um, Charles Spurgeon, one on Hudson Taylor. Listening to those biographies just showed me how much more suffering they have gone through. And that really, I must honestly tell you, that really carried me through some of those very difficult times. <laughs> Next question, how did you work through some of the intellectual and spiritual challenging periods in your life? Okay, that's a very, very good question. Um, I think let's start with, I think there was a phase during my PhD where I went through a very difficult emotional phase of you feel rejected, are you good enough in your scholarship, will I be accepted in the guild, will my publications be peer reviewed in the best journal articles and so forth. And there were two books that really, really were placed in my hand at just the right moment. The first one was a book by Andreas Korstenberger. And I want to encourage you, anything of Andreas Korstenberger you can get. He's a, he's a world scholar on the Gospel of John, uh, and he's also uh, published a number of very, very good other volumes, translations from Adolf Schlatter. But he has a book called Excellence, The Character of God in the Virtue of Scholarly Virtue by Andreas Korstenberger. So, so just listen to three paragraphs that really helped me during that struggle. Christian leaders and scholars are particularly vulnerable to the danger of self-reliance. We have spent longer hours poring over God's word than the average Christian and have published articles and monographs to convey the fruit of our learning to others. While we can be satisfied with a job well done, we should always remember that it is God who enables us to accomplish our work in the first place and God against a prideful arrogant disposition. I saw prideful, arrogant dispositions in the academy over and over. In England, in Europe, I can tell you many stories about that. Uh, and then he says here, crucially, no PhD degree is worth ruining a marriage or breaking up a family. And I've seen that as well, how that happens. You become so obsessed with your topic and your research and being accepted that you do not spend enough quality time with your family and your wife. That's the second one. The third paragraph. If our scholarship ever becomes so all-encompassing that our families fall apart, or if we have no time to be involved in the local church, that's crucial. You have to remain involved in a local evangelical church. We will have failed to maintain proper balance. And then he finishes here with one of my favorite verses, Luke 17, verse 10. After you've done everything I've commanded you to do, the Lord Jesus is talking now. He says, you should say what? We are kings? No, he says, you are all slaves who have only done what your master commanded you to do. And then he says, this also means that the true measure of our success is not 
human acclaim, but faithfulness to God's calling in our lives. This book really helped me. If you pursue a PhD in theology, please get this book. The other book was from Brian Rosner. Uh, this book, Known by God, A Biblical Theology of Personal Identity. Now, now just before I quote it, I do not agree with some of the scholars he quotes. He, he quotes one or two scholars that I've got some issues with. But in this particular chapter, uh, where he focused on um, identity, and he went through a crisis as well. Uh, Brian Rosner got his PhD from Cambridge. He went through a personal crisis. And this book is a reflection on the Old and New Testament, on where do we find our identity. And listen to these couple of paragraphs. Th this was really like a lifeline when I read this. Page 214. Rosner says, quote, I am frequently struck by how often successful people attribute their success to hard work when the truth is that luck and timing, providentially governed, both fully outside of our control, play a major part in most successful ventures. If your plans succeed, do you take full credit and think how hard-working or shrewd you have been? Or do you say, along with Paul, what do we have that we did not receive? Being known by God personally and intimately means that we are released from the futile drive to establish our own significance and to assert our superiority over other people, which is the essence of pride. It provides the security we need to rise above our antisocial need to be noticed. Instead of obsessing about ourselves, we are free to focus on serving others in love. As believers in Christ, we have no need to make a name for ourselves and to reach for the sky. Why? Because our names have already been permanently inscribed by God in heaven. Next question. What was it like studying under N.T. Wright? All right, that's a big question. All right, in short, it was both exciting, exhilarating, but also disappointing at times. Let me first focus on the exciting bits. Uh, N.T. Wright is one of those scholars who's got a formidable intellect. He went to a public school, meaning that would be a private school. So from the age of 12, he did classics, uh, Greek, Latin. So there are a number of people like that, Simon Gathercole, other scholars in England, public school system. In South Africa, you can think of someone like An Andrew Murray, the, the, the scholar, the theologian. He also at that age. So you've got people who start doing Greek and Hebrew and Latin at 12. Uh, I think that explains also some of that intellectual capacity with some of these biblical scholars in England. So, so the interesting thing about him was he's got an incredible mind. So he knows the Bible so well, the Greek, the Hebrew, the different translations and all of that. So he, and he's got so many stories and analogies and he's got an incredibly sophisticated articulate ability to sell you something really, really good. In terms of his scholarship, um, the book that meant the most to me was this book on the resurrection of Jesus, uh, a formidable book, more than 800 pages of meticulous historical research that he did. This book has actually been instrumental in bringing some skeptics and atheists to Christ. I've got one or two amazing experiences like that. I posted this book to an atheist eight years later, eight or ten years later. He phoned me, uh, contacted me and said, thank you for this book. He has now become a Christian. Remarkable. Another guy who almost became a Buddhist. I sent it to him. It was actually an uh, Amazon parcel uh, that my parents sent to him to keep it for me. He secretly opened it and read about halfway in the book till page 400. And then he said, this is the truth. And then he uh, reconciled with his wife. So amazing scholarship that he's done, historical scholarship. Uh, and then, of course, you will remember probably in America the, the, uh, the Jesus Seminar, John Dominic Crosser and Marcus Borg, those who say that almost nothing that we have in the Gospels were written by Jesus and so on. On that... Tom Wright has also been brilliant uh, in this book, Jesus and the Victory of God. I've got some reservations about later things about atonement in this book, but the first two chapters is just classic to counter the, the Jesus seminar scholarship. The veracity, the trustworthiness of the Gospels, the resurrection. On those issues, Tom Wright is a great scholar. The other thing about N.T. Wright that I also appreciated, he's very accessible to students. He would very often respond to emails within five minutes or ten minutes and most scholars don't do that 
So in that sense, he's been a, a scholar that has got a huge following internationally as well because of all these things that he brings to the table. Now, let's go to some of the things that I'm concerned about. The first thing is justification by faith. And I immediately want to say I've worked through most of those things that he's written. Here are his thick, thick monographs on that. I've wrestled with his views on the new perspective. You call it the fresh perspective on Paul. Are we justified now? Is it at the end of time? Uh, and in all due respect, I think if you go back to his Tyndale Bulletin article published in 1978. He did his PhD on Romans and my understanding is that he took a fairly controversial view in his PhD uh, on justification and he's tried to make that view acceptable and over time it looks like he's had to recalibrate and make his position more and more nuanced to the extent that there are scholars like my friend Simon Gathercole from Cambridge that I think really understands Tom Wright's development on this issue the best. Um, and Simon wrote a, a very, very good peer review article on the, these books on justification in Paul on uh, Tom Wright. And even Simon says at the end, he is not sure exactly what Tom Wright means with justified. Are we justified now already? Or is it yet at the end of time? And you see the problem with that whole thing. Though that's on justification. I also think that the book that he wrote against uh, John Piper was unhelpful. The tone, I think it was a bit arrogant. I also think that John Piper is closer to, to the right view, Luther and Calvin. Um, so I think that the tone with which he um, does all his work um, I think it is unfortunate, his views on justification. And then also uh, penal substitution, um, a number of other things, uh, female pastors that he, he, he tries to argue it's so clear from scripture. So I think on those issues, I have got some concerns and reservations about Tom Wright's work. Um, the most disappointing thing for me was probably... Uh, when I had conversations with him about Marcus Borg. They're both friends. They went to Oxford to George Caird, who was the, their supervisor. They were friends. Uh, Marcus Borg, as I told him, was invited to South Africa uh, on national TV. He said that Jesus' body was probably devoured by wild dogs, but he believes in a spiritual resurrection. And Tom Wright uh, keeps on saying that Marcus Borg was a real Christian. And I challenged him and said, but in Romans, uh, Paul says that if you believe that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. And, and that is bodily resurrection. Uh, and you're only a real Christian if you believe that. So there's a, a couple of loose ends and contradictions in Tom Wright's work that I think is important for us as evangelical Reformed Christians to take note of. question is unbiblical compromise in the academy a big problem oh yes we can talk the whole day about that I, i've said a few things about that let me give one extra illustration i was driving in a car with two scholars one day i was sitting at the back and the one was a liberal scholar the other one was an evangelical scholar well known and we were talking about the resurrection and I quizzed the, with respect the liberal scholar about paul and the resurrection and he said no paul did not believe in the empty tomb and as we were traveling, the evangelical scholar just remained silent. And at some point, he spoke to the liberal scholar and said, have you looked at my proposal for an article? And then they discussed and he said, yes, now you can get it published. And he never repudiated him after that even. And I was so disillusioned because of that. Um, I've seen conferences also that I organized over a couple of years while I was doing my PhD, where you would have liberals, evangelicals around the table, cheese and wine, all sorts of interesting things, get books published. I did the, uh, here's one volume that I did most of the editorial work for a German, German I was wondering, where did I put that thing? It's somewhere right here on the table. Anyway, it took me months to work on it. But there I also saw that some especially junior scholars, want to be accepted in the guild and then they are willing to compromise their principles in order to get a peer review article into a journal and things like that. So I've seen so much of that and God has really called me to stand up for integrity, to stand for the gospel in love and in truth also in the academy. Music